Welcome to all um, the students of ours in Environment 495, and also those of you watching this presentation on YouTube. I'm Gary Henwork. I'm director of the University of Washington Program on the Environment and co-organizer with Tim Billow of this autumn seminar series. I want to begin, as usual, with the official UW version of our local tribal land acknowledgement. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, a land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot Nation. And I wonder to underscore how much value our fall visiting speakers have had in teaching us how to assess the weight and impact of those words. Having Jessica Hernandez as our guest today is an especially timely occurrence. Her work touches in many ways on almost all of the issues we've taken up this quarter. Her range of activities, as we've listed them in her biography online, is awe-inspiring. I'm particularly drawn by the focus in her work on climate change, the background issue for pretty much every environmental debate and decision we're likely to confront in the course of this century, and also very much interested in the international dimensions of her work. We're lucky to have her with us in such close proximity to the publication of her book, as she just told me, on January 18th of the coming year. And with Penguin Random House, an impressive location, I think, for any book authored by an academic scholar. They depict her succinctly on their website as a Maya Chorti and Zapotec environmental scientist and founder of the environmental agency Pina Sol. Her book, Fresh Banana Leaves, as they say, introduces and contextualizes indigenous environmental knowledge and proposes a vision of land stewardship that heals rather than displaces, that generates rather than destroys. So with great pleasure, please join me in welcoming Jessica Hernandez tonight. Thank you for the introduction. So, buen deo pa guri. My name is Dr. Jessica Hernandez, and today I have the honor of giving the presentation. So, my presentation will be entitled Indigenous Science Within the Environmental Sciences. So before I begin, I will also like to virtually acknowledge the lands where I'm currently presenting from. I'm virtually presenting from the lands and the shared waters of the Duwamish and Coast Salish people, also known as Seattle, named after Chief Seelf. So to give you an outline of what I will be presenting on today, I will start with the introduction, then I will go into the Western science versus indigenous science. I will discuss colonization, then climate change, and one of the drivers of climate change, which is forced displacement. And then I will provide a, a quick space for my students to be able to speak if they would like to speak as well. And then I will give more information on an event that's taking place on December 8th that I'm organizing. So it's important to note that indigenous peoples are not monolithic and that's because we have differences based on our intersectionalities locations. Our knowledge systems are also place-based. So depending on where we live, we hold a different indigenous knowledge and identity. To give you an introduction about myself, I'm a transnational indigenous woman. I am displaced. My, current, my indigenous communities are separated by the border. That's why I use the word transnational. I have the educational training in the Western science and the environmental science where I graduated from my dual master's and my PhD from the University of Washington. And who I consider my first teacher or professor, environmental teacher or professor is my grandmother. Outside of academia, I lead mutual aid work to support my communities back in my ancestral lands and other relative communities that I'm in community with. As noted, I have the privilege to have my book, Fresh Manana Leaves Healing Indigenous Landscapes, coming out this January 2022. And this book, it's a collection of my family stories. It starts with the story of my dad, a Maya Chorti man who had to fight in the Central American Civil War as a child at the age of 11 years old. And then I talk about the indigenous woman and the leadership that we're taking to protect our mother earth and the violence that we continue to face as a result of that. <laughs> 
So I currently have um, a position at University of Washington Bothell where I have the privilege of teaching and kind of co-learning with my students in intro to climate science. I also have um, a consulting business entitled or called Pina Son. I also have a seat in the International Mayan League where I can advocate for climate change, especially when it comes at the international level and the global le level for indigenous peoples. I'm also a commissioner for the city of Seattle in the Urban Forestry Commission. So outside of academia, I do a lot of policy work and I think that's where my passion is, especially in the inclusion and advocacy for indigenous peoples and rights. So I think to contextualize what indigenous science is, we have to go back to what Western science is. Western science follows the scientific method where we start with a problem, then we draw or formulate a hypothesis, and obviously we decide an experiment, collect data, analyze that data, and draw conclusions. And if um, we, you know, we had some errors or we want to re replicate the experiment again, then we start all over. In Western science, indigenous peoples, we tend to be the research subjects. We tend to be the areas of expertise and not the researchers or the experts ourselves. Western science also tends to be more binary and linear. And this is because it follows those seven steps, six steps um, in a linear way. It's also reductionary and the founders of Western science tend to be non-Indigenous peoples, despite many of the scientific backgrounds and fields having some foundation in Indigenous cultures. So what is Indigenous science? For me, Indigenous science is the knowledge that has been acquired through observation and analysis by Indigenous communities since time immemorial. It is the foundation of our identity, our spirituality, and our medicine as Indigenous peoples. I like Western science, it tends to be more holistic because we connect it to ourselves, our spirits, our medicine, and then we connect it to our natural world. As you can see in these diagrams, indigenous science tends to be more holistic, and this is why I call Western science reductionary and linear. It tends to be in a cycle where we have a spirituality at the core center or hope where we also incorporate our culture through ceremonies, also environmental knowledge, medicinal knowledge, our plants and animals, which are a part of who we are as indigenous peoples. And with indigenous science, we also integrate Western science tools. So as I mentioned, because as indigenous peoples, we tend to have a stronger connection with humans and nature. It's a part of our identity and thus it's a part of our indigenous science. And it's also important to situate our historical accounts with colonization, especially when speaking about indigenous science and peoples. So this is a quote my grandmother will always share with me. They settlers had the Bibles and we had the land. We closed our eyes and ended up with their Bibles while they stole our lands. And this is one of the quotes that embody my book, Freshman and the Leaves. And like, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, my grandmother is my first environmental teacher and professor. So I wanted to honor her memory, especially the knowledge that she was able to pass down to me, the indigenous science that she was able to pass down to me since a young age. We know that colonization started with manifest destiny. And for those who don't know what manifest destiny is, it's a phrase that was coined in 1845 that it basically gave the United States the idea and the right by God to advocate, um, to expand its dominion and spread democracy and capitalism across the entire North American continent. Manifest destiny was the belief that fueled colonization, especially of Western United States. And of course, that includes the state of Washington. When we talk about indigenous communities, it's important to mention that they are the original stewards and caretakers of our land. They have been environmentally responsible for our land since time immemorial. Yet when colonization was introduced, we had to fight against capitalism and also colonialism.
We also have the myth of the pristine myth where nature was seen as pure, wilderness, and unspoiled. And this is one of the ideologies that Manifest Destiny also introduced as we continue to get our land stolen and colonization spreading across the Americas. What, something that I wanted to mention is also the stereotype of the ecological noble savage. And I think that it's important for me as an indigenous woman in the indigenous, you know, in the environmental sciences to also share what the stereotype is. The stereotype is how indigenous peoples were portrayed during colonization, where we were kind of pictured or kind of depicted as these um, mystical creatures that were in tune with nature. However, we know that due to climate change, displacement, colonization, a lot of indigenous peoples have kind of fractured that relationship they have with their environments. So I think that as an indigenous scientist, it's a balance that I have to walk with, right? Because, you know, I am an indigenous scientist. I have the persona and the identity of one. And then there is the stereotype that actually harms and, you know, creates more violence against our communities. And as you can see here, this is a campaign um, that was founded in the United States, I think in the 1960s, that portray America as beautiful. And this was like a portrayer of the stereotype of the ecological noble savage where, you know, there was an Italian actor playing an indigenous man who was crying as he witnessed the rivers being polluted. And another concept that I have taught my students is like someone trained in the Western sciences as an indigenous woman, we tend to see our world through this term coined as to I see. And to I see seeing is just a pathway in which as indigenous peoples who have Western education, especially in the sciences, we hold our Western knowledge and ways of knowing. And we also carry the other lens that our identities also portray in us. And that's the indigenous knowledge and way of, of knowing. So indigenous knowledge, of course, relates to traditional ecological knowledge or other terms that indigenous peoples prefer to use. So my perspective as an indigenous scientist is that I see our indigenous way of life or the indigenous science, as I like to refer to it, as healing our mother earth. We know that through the Western ways of life and also colonization, many extractive methods that were harming our earth and desecrating our lands were introduced. And I like to use this picture because it shows the reverse of manifest destiny. And this kind of portrays what as indigenous peoples, the movements and the resistant and the peaceful movements that we're leading to protect our mother earth to kind of reverse what Western ways of of life and living kind of introduced. And we know that through colonization, we got the concept of energy introduced as well, where extractive energy, where fossil fuel burnings became something that our societies became heavily dependent on, which is desecrating our lands and of course, leading to climate change. And that's my next topic, climate change. So we know that the global, global average temperatures of our earth is rapidly increasing. And despite that, every year, the United Nations and the global leaders meet to try to mitigate these impacts. However, we're seeing how those um, annual meetings are failing us because uh, as we see in this graph, every year, the global average temperature is increasing. And so we know that's a result of the increase in greenhouse gases and how they basically cycle through our environment, through the greenhouse effect, and ultimately, results in the increased temperatures of our globe. We also see how there's no slowing down in the global warming. So what I wanted to, to portray was how Western science is already telling us that our climate change is happening, but yet we still have people who don't believe in climate science or who deny that climate science is human caused. And when we talk about climate change in indigenous peoples, I wanted to kind of highlight the five inequities that we face as indigenous peoples when it comes to climate change. The first inequity is that degree of responsibility for climate change. We tend to be more responsible for the climate change impacts despite not being the ones that are emitting the most greenhouse gases. The second inequity is the impact of climate change in the global south. So as um, being a part of the global north, most of the countries that emit the most greenhouse gases are developed nations. And we see how 
as a result, we're impacting the global south because climate change impacts are drastically impacting those communities. We see that through the increase of natural disasters that the global south is facing. And then we see how those natural disasters are driving many communities away from their lands. So as a result, you know, when it comes to kind of accepting climate refugees, we tend to use you know, policies that criminalize that forced displacement, despite our country being responsible for many people being driven out of their communities. The third inequity is the ability and capacity to deal with the climate change, with the impacts of climate change. We know that, you know, going back to inequity one, we have the highest responsibility as indigenous peoples, yet when it comes to mitigating or adapting to, to climate change impacts, we don't have the capacity or the ability because we're limited on resources. In equity four, we also see the intergenerational impacts of climate change. And that's because we see how our cultures are being fractured because of the environmental impacts that our indigenous communities are facing, especially as climate change impacts are exacerbating most, most of those disparities. We witness how the pandemic kind of amplified those disparities that already existed among indigenous communities. And I hope that that was a wake up call for all of us. Inequity five is the gender disparities of climate change. And I think this one kind of hits closer to home and myself because as an indigenous woman, inequity number five is something that impacts me on the daily basis. As this has been noted in many reports such as ADESA, indigenous peoples and the role they may play in combating climate change are rarely considered in public discourses on climate change. And as a result, I wanted to kind of share how we saw this in the United Nations COP26 conference, where indigenous um, activists or, or water protectors or land defenders basically said what we already knew that our voices are missing in this conference. We saw how this conference kind of had a lack of indigenous peoples, despite us being in the front line being the frontline communities for climate justice, environmental justice. We also see how in the United Nations in these conferences, women and the voices of us tend to be ignored. So I think that going back to inequity number five, the gender disparities of climate change, when we face, when we add the layer of a gender and also our identity as indigenous women, we tend to face the most impacts and oppression when it comes to climate change. And this has been noted that with, as an indigenous woman, we tend to nourish our communities. We tend to pro make our environment safer, especially when we own land. We tend to kind of benefit our communities through our healthy life ways and also the nurture and nature. We tend to make our communities more resilient. We tend to increase our education and make our communities more prosperous. And I think that this kind of ties back to why it's important to strengthen women's land rights, especially when it comes to indigenous women. It's kind of hard not to talk about inequity number five without bringing up the missing and murdered indigenous women pandemic that's impacting our communities today. We know that the medium age for missing and murdered indigenous women and girls is 29. We know that 98 of these cases are still unknown. And that's because we don't face, we don't experience the same level of media attention or the same resources to try to address these cases. We know that 506 missing and murdered indigenous women and girls cases were identified across 71 selected urban cities. And 128 of those cases were cases of missing indigenous women. So I think that when we, talk about climate change and the inequities that we face as indigenous women, it's kind of hard to not address the missing and murdered indigenous women pandemic that we're facing because you know that's something that as an indigenous woman, I have to embody and something that our communities continue to try to address despite not having enough resources to do so. And I also wanted to bring up the fact that Irma Galindo Barrios, an indigenous Oaxacan woman from the Mistec community, 
was basically went missing during the um, United Nations COP conference in Oaxaca, Mexico. So I think that this shows how as indigenous women, when we tend to be outspoken, when we tend to advocate for the protection of our mother earth, our land in this case of in Irma's case for her sacred forest, we face most of the violence. We face that layer that ends up resulting in us going missing. And of course there's no media attention. There's rarely any accountability that these um, governments take in order to help find us in order for them those numbers to reach reduce especially as I mentioned it's indigenous women who are in the front lines of climate justice of environmental justice of these peaceful resistant movements that are enacted to protect our natural resources and our sac sacred lands and now I'm going to connect climate change and those inequities to my community. And I'm going to kind of do that with one of the driving factors of climate change, which is forced displacement and climate refugees. So I am a part of a Maya nation, the Maya Chorti nation. And it's important to mention that there are 31 different Maya nations across Central America, um, South of Mexico, across the Americas. So indigenous Maya people, we continue to face forced displacement. And that's because in the 1980s and the 1960s, there was a, a civil war that took place in our lands. And the United Nations has coined this war as a genocide that was committed against indigenous Maya people. In El Salvador, the Central American Civil War took place from the 1980s to the 1990s. In Guatemala, the Central American Civil War took place between the 1960s and the 1990s. And it's important to mention that the violence that kind of led to this civil war across Central American countries began before and it still went on for years. And I bring this up because like at the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned that my father was a Maya Chorty child, a, a little boy at the age of 11 years old, he was forced to fight in that war. And I think that it's important to highlight that because it's a part of the genocide that, you know, oftentimes we talk about genocide as a past tense, but for my communities and my families, it's a genocide that happened a generation before me and that's the generation of my parents. Unfortunately, when we talk about the Mayan civilization or indigenous Maya people, there's this false narrative that are we are extinct and that's because in archaeology the classic maya collapse um kind of and the decline of the mayan civilization kind of created this narrative that as mayan people we are extinct right so when we're trying to advocate for our rights especially in the united nations or in the international kind of environments and spaces, we have to kind of start from square one where we have to teach people that we're actually not extinct, right? We still speak our Maya languages. As I mentioned, there's over 31 Mayan um, communities and nations that across the Americas. And I think that because of this historical account that continues to portray the Mayan civilization as extinct, when we are advocating for our rights as indigenous Maya people, we kind of have to kind of re-educate people starting with the fact that we're still alive right and I think that that tends to happen with a lot of indigenous communities because there's still that lack of knowledge that as indigenous peoples we're not kind of something from the past we are still in the present and we will still continue to be in the future in on this earth when we talk about indigenous Maya people in Guatemala in 2010 that's when they adapted the indigenous rights into their constitution. So we're talking about nine, well, 11 years ago. In El Salvador, the constitution was amended to recognize indigenous peoples in 2014. And I think that this goes back to the fact that during the Central American Civil War, we faced a genocide and the government doesn't want to take accountability or that responsibility of that genocide that was committed against our people. And we see that through the erasure of our indigeneity and indigenous communities in both Guatemala and Salvador, the two Central American countries that were hit the hardest with this civil war that took place in the Central American hemisphere. When we talk about Central America, it's also important to mention that a lot of our lands were stolen and large pockets of our lands were sold through land grabs. And these land grabs went to corporations, agricultural corporations, and introduced plantations. 
we see how banana, despite it being an invasive species, kind of has become a relative. And that's how invasive species tend to adapt. And I think that an important teaching that I was taught by my elders is that in the environmental sciences, we tend to look at invasive species as weeds, as pests, right? We want to remove them. But my elders always reminded me that invasive species are displaced relatives. And that just shows a connection that as indigenous peoples, we have with our plants. So every time when I do restoration work and I have my students with me, I always remind them to ask the plants, even if they're invasive for permission before removing that, because while they might not be our relatives to indigenous peoples in the Americas, they're someone's relatives. And I think it's important to honor that. We also see how the land grabs were sold to coffee plantations, to mango plantations, to avocado plantations. So everything that you can think of that comes from Latin America is, is, is basically being grown on indigenous lands that were stolen and sold to these international corporations through land grabs. So one of the terms that I coined throughout you know, my career and also my research is eco-colonialism. And what does eco-colonialism mean? So eco-colonialism is when non-indigenous peoples govern over our natural resources and indigenous lands, but without consulting indigenous peoples of those lands or respecting indigenous sovereignty. Eco-colonialism is also the severe altering of our landscapes due to settler colonialism and the ideologies that it introduced, including climate change impacts. Eco-colonialism is also the lack of resources offered to indigenous communities or communities of color that are already experiencing the impacts of climate change that oftentimes results in forced displacement. And going back to Latin America, we know that 80% of the world's biodiversity is stewarded by indigenous peoples. And 50% of the world's biodiversity is located in Latin America. Now I always want to, I always like reminding people that Latin America also is includes the Caribbean, because oftentimes in Latin America discourses, we forget about the Caribbean. And it's to no surprise that the deadliest place for environmental indigenous activists is Latin America. And that's because, you know, as I mentioned, 50% of the world's biodiversity is located in Latin America, which means that indigenous communities of Latin America are still caretaking of those lands, stewarding those lands, and fighting against the fact that these lands are trying to also be sold in large land grabs to international corporations. These lands are being deforced. Um, facing deforestation, as we see in the Amazon, because they're trying to sell the lands through land grabs to um, cattle farming. And I think that, you know, when I go back to the reality that as a transnational indigenous woman whose indigenous community also comes from Central America, which is in Latin America, it's kind of hard to talk about the work that I do without acknowledging the fact that, you know, my paternal ancestral lands in Latin America are also considered the deadliest place for environmental activists. So when we talk about climate refugees, we had to also kind of point out the reality that vulnerable people living in, most, in some of the most fragile and conflict affected countries are often disappropriately impacted by climate change impacts. Climate refugees, or as sometimes it's coined as climate migrants are basically environmental migrants who were forced to flee due to a sudden or gradual alteration in the envir natural environments. And this tends to happen when they face natural disasters that forcefully displace many people, especially as their natural disasters tend to kind of amplify or exacerbate the disparities that already exist among indigenous communities. As we know, there are over 20 272 million migrants in the world and 25.9 million were forcefully displaced or are refugees. We see how also when we talk about displacement, 143 million people are internally displaced and internally displaced just means that they're displaced within their country. Like um, many rural communities where indigenous commun people live are forced to live, you know, kind of displace or relocate to cities or major cities, especially as they continue to face climate change impacts. And in this diagram, we see that 18.8 million 
of people are displaced because of natural disaster related um, incidents that happened. And 200 million to a billion of total migrants is due to climate change. And it's gonna continue increasing to a billion by 2050. So one of the things that I like to always ask um, the audience is like, how do we, like what kind of, in the way, how are we seeing the United States kind of treat um, climate refugees, especially as people are displaced to the United States? And we know that um, there are many factors of mobility that are impacting indigenous peoples. And those factors include political, economic, cultural, environmental, and social. And that continues to kind of impact the vulnerability and capacity that as indigenous peoples we have. And I think that the driving factor of those five um, factors of mobility are as a result of climate change. And we often hear how, you know, refugees or migrants are kind of benefiting, right, are stealing jobs. But it's also important to mention that, well, there are opportunities that are granted to people who are facing climate change impacts or were forcefully displaced. Many of the challenges that refugees face is disruptive social networks, right? And that's because you had to uproot your entire family, your entire community to new locations so your social networks are interrupted. We also see how labor is exploited. And that's because um, oftentimes people, especially businesses tend to take advantage of immigrants or you know, if they don't have the legal foundation to kind of um, pay them for their labor, but you know, in an unjust way. We also see how many climate refugees don't have access to critical services especially when we talk about health, when we talk about economic services, especially during the pandemic, we're seeing how the pandemic is impacting a lot of refugees that we're seeing increase in the United States. And now I wanted to take the next five minutes because I know I invited some of my students to see if anyone has anything to say that they have learned about indigenous science that anyone who wants to share with the rest of the um, attendees. Uh, I'll go ahead and say something. Um, I think this class um, has been very helpful to me in connecting what I've learned through Western sciences um, to the concept of like how knowledge and especially in indigenous communities is passed on and how important that knowledge is to like accept in Western sciences because they earned it through many years of just existing and being in those locations. So I think it's very important and that's something that I've learned. Um, it's very important to consider that knowledge as well. Thank you, Santi. Anybody else wants to share what they have learned about Indigenous science? Um, I just wanted to say, um, I really didn't have a lot of knowledge about Indigenous science um, before taking the class. And I've just learned so much about like um, Indigenous sciences and just the concept of two-eyed seeing and climate justice overall. And kind of like Santi was saying, like it's something that we have to accept um, within like Western science because that knowledge is so important in um control like I guess controlling climate change and like going about that issue so um I've just learned so much and I truly think like it is very interesting and something that we have to learn about so yeah thank you Blend. and I see Alex I see your hand yeah I was just gonna add on to what um Santi and Blaine said just kind of like that, accepting that they're both like valid. And definitely what I learned about this class was more like um, climate injustices that happen, like especially with indigenous peoples, African-Americans, um, Hispanics and all those other minorities. So um, that this class has definitely like taught me like about like being aware of like who's being affected by the climate 
Okay, I see other hands. Mena, do you want to say something? Um, yeah, I also like wanted to talk uh, about like the concept of two-eyed seeing, which is like seeing through the lens of like Western science and also indigenous science. And I think like this personally helped me. Like <clears throat> I obviously learned Western science my whole life and then learning about indigenous science helped me to understand Western science better and to like, especially um, in terms of like climate change because I feel like when you're just seeing through like the Western science lens, it's, you don't really understand like the importance of climate change, but indigenous science helps you understand like why it's important to keep the balance of nature. And I think that if we want to like make like actual changes, like it's really important to include this perception. Thank you, Mena. And I see Min. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to add on to um, all the previous conversations. I was just going to say that before this class, I didn't really know anything about Indigenous knowledge or science in general. But I learned that they have a very strong connection to their lands and just their ecosystem. And then this means that they get affected from the climate change a lot easier than us, where we're kind of away from just pure plantation slash forest, or we don't really depend on like um, the forest or like whatever that's around us to survive. So yeah. Thank you. And I wanted to use this time to kind of like pass the mic to my students because like I'm really proud of everything that they have learned and also like how they are becoming those um, climate justice advocates, right? Because I think it's always important for me personally to do that multi-directional learning, right? Where I'm not just um, teaching, I'm also learning from my students and I'm and that's been a, an amazing um, group of students. And I kind of wanted to end my presentation with um, just giving you more information on the event that's happening on December 8th. So you want to learn more about how climate change is impacting and forcefully displacing Indigenous peoples. In December 8th, I can send both of your professors the information so that you can attend and learn more because I think that it's important for us and I think this is a great opportunity where you get to learn from different indigenous voices and perspectives and not just one and that that will be another um, kind of opportunity for everyone to attend an event and kind of see how displacement is talked not just at the national level but also the international level so thank you for having me today and I guess that's my entire presentation. Thanks so much, Jessica, and thanks for bringing your students along with you. It was really nice to hear from them as well. And um, respecting that, part of what I want to do is try to give first opportunity to our students here in the Environment 495. If they have questions, there are two ways, of course, as always, to um, uh, engage in the conversation. Uh, you can raise your hand and we will call on you, or if you just want to put a question in the chat, we can also field it that way. So let me give a little while just to see if anybody wants to jump in. And uh, okay, we have Lauren. Yes, go ahead. Hi. Hi, Jessica. I just want to say thank you so much for your lovely presentation and for taking the time out of your day to be here. Um, I was, first of all, congratulations on your book. And I was wondering um, how it came to be and what your process was. And if you just wanted to talk a little bit more about it, I would love to hear about it. Yeah, so the book was something that I started on my final year of my graduate studies. So it was during my dissertation. And I think that it took two years because of the pandemic and everything else was slowed down. So I guess one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book is because oftentimes whenever I would share Indigenous knowledge or Indigenous science, I was asked to cite it. And I think that that's one of the constraints that Western science tends to have where only knowledge that it's like peer review or published is actually validated. So I wanted to kind of create that tool 
for myself and I usually think of like the future generations, right? The future generations of indigenous students who want to pursue the environmental sciences who are told to do that emotional labor of like, you know, how are you going to prove your theory or your lived experience? And I think that's, you know, something that I had to deal by, you know, as a person throughout my undergraduate, throughout my graduate studies. So I wanted to use this book also to honor the legacies of my relatives and also community members, especially um, given that I come from a family that does a lot of advocacy for our environments and seeing how, you know, because I think that with the PhD, I kind of um, acquired that privilege. And I remember telling my dad, oh, I passed my dissertation. And then he just told me instead of congratulating me, he was like, oh, now you have more responsibility to, you know, for our communities. And I think that's one of the principles that as an Indigenous woman, I embody. So I wanted to use that privilege to also elevate the voices of those people who are often not even left in the margins. We are left in the footnotes, right? Like Indigenous peoples especially since not all of us have those Western degrees to validate our knowledge systems. So yeah, it was a healing process also because I got to interview my relatives and I tend to always kind of teach sciences by kind of avoiding a lot of terminology. And if I do use terminology, I kind of define it. So it was a beautiful experience to write outside of the university press and do it with a publishing company that is not for academics specifically. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Well, we wait, let me add something to that, which is you mentioned the way in which writing the book was a way of validating, right? Indigenous knowledge. Um, you sort of answered a question I was thinking of asking too, because I think there's another impact of the book that you have, which is, um, how do we go about translating or whatever verb you want to use? I'm not sure that's the right one. Translating local indigenous knowledges of all kinds to the global scale of the big problems that we face, right? Um, part of what writing the book and especially publishing it where you're, you're publishing it, um, you know, at this is one of the biggest presses in the world, right? Penguin Random House. Um, you're reaching audiences there that you otherwise wouldn't be able to do. And in a particular kind of genre, right? An autobiographical one as well as a scientific one. I don't know if that's a question, it's a comment maybe. So that wasn't a question, right? <laughs> okay. I, no, no, sometimes I just, you know, this, uh, yeah, right. Continuation of thought, we'll call it that, okay? Hmm. But talk a little more about the book. I think people would like to, um, you said you interviewed family members, your immediate family members. Did you go back to Latin America and interview more distant family members there? How deeply did you, you reach in doing this? Yeah, so one of the, I guess the beauties of being a transnational indigenous woman is that my communities are across borders. So one of the ways that I was able to gather their testimonies, because I think one of the, the reasons why I also opted to go outside of the university press is because I didn't want to summarize what they would tell me, but rather put it in quotations, right? Kind of publish their own testimonies so that I'm also not taking away their autonomy in telling their own stories. So through that publishing, I'm able to write quotation, you know, quotation marks and kind of put it in a vignette form where their testimonies are included. And I think that that's one of the ways that um, I gathered their testimonies. Obviously, it was in our native languages, many other languages that I personally um, speak as well. And also, it wasn't just my relatives. It was also communities and nations that I'm in um, community with in terms of like who I know. And I think that hopefully this book also elevates the mutual aid that I have co be co um, been co-leading um, outside of academia to help these indigenous communities and relatives. And I think that, you know, we use the word relatives a lot as indigenous peoples, like they might not have to be directly blood related, but you know, if we know them, there are relatives to elevate their voices and also their movements. And I think that given that Latin America is one of the deadliest countries for indigenous land protectors and right defenders, I wanted to kind of amplify that, especially in the indigeneity discourses, right? Because we tend to 
forget about indigenous people south of the border, despite it being, you know, when we talk about indigeneity of the Americas, we only focus on the United States and Canada while forgetting Mexico, Central America, or in this case, the Caribbean, especially as, as we're seeing how climate change is displacing a lot of Caribbeans. And with the recent news, we see how the United States the United States treats a lot of climate refugees. And a prime example that recently happy, happened was how the United States treated our Haitian relatives when they were trying to seek asylum at the border. So, yeah, it was kind of like elevating the indigeneity from south of the border that's often dismissed when we talk about indigeneity across the Americas. We'll call on raised hands as soon as they appear, but I have a whole bunch of questions, so I'm happy to continue too. I'm a, uh, actually a scholar of literature and languages, and I want to come back to both of those things in your work because they both interest me. You talked about how many languages do you speak? I speak four or five. I lose count. <laughs> that just kind of blows the minds of most of us here in the U.S., um, many of whom are monolingual or bilingual, maybe. What how do you think that multilingualism affects your experience of the world? What, what, what seems to you a particular value in that? So I think that one of the benefits, and I think, you know, it kind of made it harder for me to go through like K through 12, the educational system, especially when we talk about bilingual education is often tailored in English and Spanish. And as someone who, you know, both of those languages are colonial to both of her communities, it kind of, you know, and it's like the experience that a lot of indigenous peoples face. Like, for instance, you know, if you come from Haiti, if you come from Central America, or, you know, Barbados, you kind of are put in these bilingual systems. So I think that, you know, coming through my K through 12, especially my K through six, where, you know, you're learning the language, it kind of made it a barrier because I had to, you know, learn multiple languages to be in the bilingual education to begin with. And I think that as I grew up, it kind of taught me how to be a storyteller, how to be able to write. I think the best compliment that I get is like, oh, you're a great writer, but in my mind, I'm like, oh, okay, I don't know how, you know, my child's, my, 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 what is it, my seven year old self is like, oh, I cannot believe that, right? Because I used to struggle a lot in school because of bilingual education and the K through 12, K through 12 educational system and how kind of it dismisses indigenous languages from the colonial framework that it operates in. And I think that because of that multilingual abilities, like I can communicate with many people, I can't, you know, have conversations. And I guess it's kind of integrated in the stories that I tell or the storytelling that I evoked as a woman, especially now with a PhD, right? Like, how do I lecture where it's not just me kind of, you know, boring my students? Because I think as a professor or instructor, we get to see how students are interacting or kind of, you know, kind of feeling about our lectures. So like, how do you make them more engaged, engaging, especially given that, you know, college is a settler colonial framework, right? Where you have to lecture students, but how do you kind of incorporate different ways of um, teaching, especially, you know, when you do also have students who don't necessarily speak English or are learning English as well. Tim had had his hand up. You want to jump in, Tim? Sure. <clears throat> um, I, actually, I, I had another question, but I, I think I'm just going to follow up on the language question a little bit. Um, I, I'm just curious, and this may be too complicated or, or beyond the scope of what you're able to answer, but my impression is that a lot of the indigenous cultures in Latin America um, still speak their native and indigenous languages, whereas you contrast that with tribes in North America, where a lot of times the languages have been lost. Um, and they certainly are being recovered now, but I, I was wondering if you have any sense of like what that means in a cultural context to be able to still have your language and, uh, and how that, I don't know, may, maybe creates a deeper understanding of, of culture. And maybe if you could speak to some of the differences you see between Latin American indigenous groups versus North American and, and in, within that context of, of having your language versus not having, or not may, maybe having as much access to the language. So we still face language barriers as well. Like, you know, there is like a 
not every generation is taught their language. And I think that that has to do a lot with the trauma because I think, you know, like my father always told me, our languages also carry the trauma, but it can also carry the healing, right? So your the generation kind of has to do some of that healing in order for us, you know, that generation to teach the other generation their language. And I think with that, it's what I see, especially being in the International Mayan League, I see how a lot of our um, indigenous peoples are being displaced and at the border, they're not being given or granted language access to their indigenous languages. In On December 8th, when we're having that event, it's actually the third death anniversary of Yakalin Kal, an indigenous Maya Ketchi um, young girl, seven years old, died at the U.S. border custody because um, she was sick and they gave the her father a medical exam report in Spanish, and he did not speak Spanish. He spoke Ketchi, Maya Ketchi, and as a result, he signed it. But as as a fact, you know, because she didn't get the proper healthcare access and the language barrier of like, you know, again, going back to, you know, everybody from Latin America must speak Spanish. Um, it kind of ignores indigenous peoples. She passed away, right? So December 8th, when we're having that panel where we're talking about indigenous solidarity across Americas, we're going to be honoring the memory of the young Maya Ketchi young girl who passed away under U.S. border custody. And I think that that kind of ties back to climate change, how it's displacing a lot of our indigenous Maya communities, especially from Central America in this case, you know, my paternal relatives, and how even speaking that language ends up harming us, right? Because we don't get access to legal services in our language. They're often given to us in Spanish, but many of our relatives, they don't speak Spanish. So in this case, um, you know, we lost a relative, a seven-year-old, you know, child. And we see how through these frameworks, it's always our indigenous children who are targeted or who end up being harmed. So I think that knowing our languages, you know, it's a great thing. But when it comes to being displaced, we end up facing more barriers like language access or um, translation services in our languages as well. Thank you. Yeah, that's interesting perspective. Um, if there aren't other questions, I, I did want to ask about the uh, uh, indigenous rights uh, clauses that are being inserted into the Guatemalan and, and uh, Salvadorian constitutions. And I, I don't know if you could tell us more about that and what that looks like. Yeah, so I think um, a lot of these things end up and like kind of being lip service where, you know, they're like, oh, we're recognizing indigenous peoples. But when it comes to like, for instance, we're still facing those land grabs where our lands are being sold in, um, you know, hundreds of acres to these international corporations to make more plantations. And I think that as a result, you know, it's like there it's kind of like the UNDRIP, right? The United Nations Declaration of Indigenous Peoples Rights that, the, you know, the United Nations that like globally should be is adapted, but it's not really applied. And I think that, you know, it's just like, oh, we're recognizing you in these legal frameworks, but we're not really taking any action to support that recognition. So I think that in those documents in the constitution is just recognizing us is basically saying, oh, we have the rights to be sovereign, to be, you know, to have our rights as indigenous peoples, our rights to exist. But when it comes to even the disparities that we continue to face, especially our indigenous women is still kind of more of the lip service or, you know, like written um, declarations, but not necessarily something that's been enacted in action for. Let me follow up on Tim's question because I wanted to ask about that too. And I'm not surprised that there are ways in which certainly in relatively short term, I mean, in terms of decades, it really can feel like there's not much impact from changes like that. But I was thinking about the potential impact of something like that as a change in the US constitution. A lot of the people that we've had and uh, come and talk to us this quarter, have talked about the importance of treaties, the importance of sovereign nation status, right? Um, Canada, I think, did something with regard to their constitution that hasn't even come up for debate in the United States. Um, but we do have a system where part of what it does is, um, you know, it gives you a lever like the Civil Rights Act did to go to court and to make very public statements about issues. So I'm curious that could this, could the U.S. do this? What do you think? 
Well, I think the U.S. can definitely do that. And I think that recently we saw how the White House adopted um, indigenous knowledge as a form of their Yeah, so it says White House commits to elevating indigenous knowledge in federal policy decisions. So I hope that, you know, the United States is kind of going in that direction. Sorry, I put the wrong link. Um, Going in that right direction, especially when it comes to environmental policy, right? Because we continue to see how environmental policy impacts indigenous communities of worst and the first. And hopefully... Um, in the United States, hopefully this administration, especially being one of the first administration that has brought indigenous peoples into the cabinet, it starts to have formulating those discussions to also not just, you know, provide that legal framework or that text, written text, but also take action into a, a effect, especially as, you know, many movements like the North Dakota Access Pipeline, we saw how that ended. We see how Imanokea, the Kanaka Maoli are still fighting and protecting their sacred side from another, you know, giant telescope being built. So hopefully we're moving in the right direction, but, you know, it all depends on how we can work collectively, especially, you know, it's, it's policy, right? So there's always going to be opposing forces going against those policies. Right. That was, I sent the press release about that around to our students right when it came out. Um, But I want to, I think, underscore the way in which those sorts of policy statements and uh, you know about government policies and what they should do, those can change really quickly from one administration to the next, right? Constitutional rights are really embedded in a way, at least theoretically in the US, that other statements of principle like that aren't. Okay, we're at 529. Last chance for a student question, if anybody has one. And if not, I'm going to suggest we all feel free to unmute and clap loudly if you want. Thank you so much, Jessica, for really giving you the perspective, which has really sort of filled out and expanded, right, the range of things that we're, we're considering in this seminar in really, really productive ways, I think. Um, you're more than welcome to stick around for a little bit. Students sometimes do stay in chat for a little bit afterwards, but Um, Anybody who's been teaching already today, you're absolutely free to depart at this moment as well. So anyway, thanks to everybody. Don't forget to post. As always, I will send some of those posts on to Jessica afterwards. They're from our Canvas site. Um, So I'll let you know what a few of the students say.